This text is from Luke 4, and it's verses 14 through 21. Let's listen for God's living word for us this morning. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and placed, found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. And will you pray with me, please? Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on us. Melt us, mold us, fill us, use us, we pray. And may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight because you, O Lord, are our rock and our redeemer. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Amen. Okay. Mission statements. How many of you have ever worked for an organization with a mission statement? Yes, yeah. Uh, most successful organizations, schools, businesses, nonprofits, churches have mission statements. And the purpose of mission statements, as most of you know, is to serve as kind of a north star for the work of a group, to tell the group what its focus is. And a cool thing about a good mission statement is that it also lets an organization know what they should not be about as well. So, for, recent, for example, recently, Trader Joe's, Joe's rolled out their mission statement for 2022. And it is, quote, to bring you the best quality products at the best price. End quote. That's their mission statement. Well, let's say you made chocolate and you made exquisite chocolate, high-quality chocolate, but it was pricey. Your chocolate would probably meet the standard for Trader Joe's high-quality part, but probably not the price part. So your product might be nixed from the list. Trader Joe's doesn't have a huge store, as you know, but they have a store of high-quality, mostly fair trade and organic products for reasonable prices. That's their mission. It tells us it tells them what to buy, what to sell, what not to buy, what not to sell. And it tells them who they are. Well, in many ways, Jesus gives us his mission statement in our text for today. This is the beginning of Jesus' ministry. He's been baptized, tempted in the wilderness for 40 days, and now, at the ripe age of 30, begins his ministry. And within days, he jumps to the top of the preacher charts of the day. Jesus is suddenly a rock star. And the text tells us he goes to Galilee, a place with a lot of towns, maybe not unlike Muskegon or Oceana County, and he starts teaching in synagogues, and everybody loves what he's saying. He is the new preacher that everybody wants to hear. Well, we can only imagine that when he came to his hometown, Nazareth, the town was ecstatic. Hometown boy comes home and it looks like he's going to make it big. When I lived in, in Benton Harbor, Sinbad, who was the son of a Baptist preacher in Benton Harbor, or Wilson Chandler, the basketball star who grew up in Benton Harbor, or Joey Bell, pro football player, who actually 
started out as one of the poorest children in the city, whenever they would come home to Benton Harbor, the town would get really excited. It would be a buzz. You could almost feel it in the air. Children wanted to leave school so they could go visit where these men were, and everybody was talking about them. One of our own had made it big. I wonder if it was like that for the people of Nazareth when Jesus came home that day. And Jesus goes into the synagogue and is handed the scroll and he reads from Isaiah and says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me to bring good news to the poor, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now the year of the Lord's favor in the Old Testament is the same as the year of Jubilee. You can read about that in Leviticus 25. The year of Jubilee was supposed to happen every 50 years in Israel. And in the year of Jubilee, all financial and real estate debts were to be forgiven. Anyone who lost land for some reason would have to give it back. Who, or who lost land for some reason would get it back. So the year of Jubilee would be really good news for people who were poor and struggling. They would have a chance to start over, get back what their families had lost, but it was probably not that good new, much of that good news for those who were wealthier because they would have to give back some of their stuff and forgive debts. It was a time to level the material and financial playing field in Israel. And most Bible scholars report that the people of God never followed God's command to practice jubilee. Well, all the people in the synagogue that day would have known that Jesus was proclaiming that this was part of his mission to help people live into the Jubilee. When I think of the year of Jubilee, I sometimes have an image in mind from the Christmas Carol where Scrooge, whose life was transformed, holds up his debt books, rips out the pages, whips them in the air, proclaiming at the top of his lungs that all of the debtors are forgiven. The crowds cheer. They have a new start, a new beginning. They are free. And the cool thing is that Scrooge is free too. You see, the year of Jubilee not only is good news for the poor, it freed the wealthy from their fearful bondage to their stuff and their position and their power. In the year of Jubilee, everyone is invited to trust in God alone. So this... It's the favorable year of the Lord that Jesus is talking about here, and it's about freedom, real freedom. And this is the first word we hear from Jesus here in Luke. The good news of freedom to the poor, release to the captives, healing the brokenhearted. It's like the topic sentence of Jesus' ministry. Everything he will do and be is about that. This is Jesus' mission statement. Well, before we consider what his, G his mission statement might mean, let's consider what Jesus' mission statement wasn't, what he didn't say. His main focus was not to become a big-name preacher that would make his hometown proud and make him famous. His main focus was not to be sure there were young families in the synagogue so it would survive. His main focus was not to create a religious institution that would live forever. His main focus was not to make everyone feel okay. His main focus is not to set up a political realm or some kind of power. His main focus, his mission, the reason for his ministry, according to Luke, is to set people free to live in a kind of jubilee. Reminds me of the beloved community and peaceable kingdom images we talked about last week. Now, if you read on in the text, you will read that the people were not thrilled with the message of their hometown hero that day. In fact, it upset many of them. Some of them wanted to kill him. I wonder if one of the elders pulled him aside and said, Jesus, come on, you are so gifted. Why this? Why don't you use your gifts to do something big? Make us proud. Why are you upsetting everyone? But no, Jesus is clear. The Spirit was on him so he could bring good news to the poor, proclaim release to all the captives, bind up the brokenhearted, let the oppressed go free, proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. 
He was so clear about this that he says, today, this is being fulfilled in me. Ooh, it's a pretty big thing to say. I'm going to invite us to think about what this means for us as individuals and as a congregation in a minute. But before I do that, I must emphasize that this mission statement is about a kind of world, a kind of world where everyone has what they need to survive and thrive. And it's a message for all people. The gospel has significant implications for how we live together in the world. When we talk that way, sometimes people think we're getting political. But we don't work for a better world because it's the political thing to do or the vogue thing to do or the politically correct thing to do or the woke thing to do. We work for a better world for all human beings and all creation because it is a Jesus thing to do. It is part of Jesus' mission statement. And thus it's our call for those who follow him. With that in mind, I wonder what this might mean for us. Most of us middle, upper middle class Christians in 2022. What might Jesus' mission statement mean for us and require of us as people who want to follow him? Well, first, let's talk about that word freedom. The word is in the text only once, but the word release and other words may be summed up in this word freedom, I believe. Jesus is inviting us, all of us, to freedom and new levels. The word freedom can be a little bit difficult for us to stand here in the United States. I mean, the fullness of what Jesus means here. We talk about freedom a lot in our country, and what a gift our freedom is, right? Amazing freedom. And thank you to any of you veterans who helped make that so here among us. But often when we talk about freedom in these days, we also seem to be talking about our rights. We feel our freedom is at risk if our rights are at risk. And indeed, in a free society, people must have the right to worship as they wish, speak openly about their values and more. But a free society also must be a moral society, as Rabbi Jonathan Sachs writes. When our need to have our rights means we don't consider the needs of others, we somehow have lost our freedom. In the kind of jubilee Jesus is proclaiming here, we must all give up something and care about the common good for all of us to really be free. And this is the power of Jesus' message and preaching. He wanted us all, everyone, to be free. And part of the message here is that the poor, if the, when the poor aren't free, those of us who are on the top of the food chain may not realize it, but we are bound too, maybe in ways we can't see. So this message from Jesus is a social message, first and foremost here. But in order to live into this social message, we must look at ourselves and consider how this good news may set us free as individuals and as a church. This invitation to becoming free invites us to really look at ourselves. Let's do that for a minute. Where are we in bondage? Where do we long for freedom in our lives? Are we bound to our possessions? Are we bound to the need to keep the church the way it's always been? Are we bound to our politics? Are we bound to our grudges and the ways we have been hurt? Bound to the pain of something that's happened to us? Negative self-talk? Bound to shame over things that we've done that we can't undo? Bound to worries about loved ones and what might happen to them? Jesus invites us to ponder, where are we bound? I'd like, you to I'd like to tell you a story of one of my favorite human beings in the world. Her name, I will call her Dolores. Dolores had a son who was a gifted musician. He was also gay, and he struggled with depression. In desperation one day, Dolores' son tragically took his own life. And I don't need to tell you the incredible grief and anguish and loss the journey of life was for Dolores and her husband after that. Understandably so, the loss and guilt consumed her for many years. And there were times when it was hard for her to get out of bed, much less hear about other women's sons who were getting married, making them grandmothers, and being successful. And she was understandably angry at times. 
Those of us who loved her ached for her and with her, and she did her share of crying out to God. For a while, she was locked in the bondage of the loss. She told me one day that she heard a sermon in a church about Jesus wanting to set her free. She told me, I knew it was time. And she started listening to the whispering, this whispering in her ear. She said, it was like Jesus was right in my ear saying to me, I love you, Dolores. I love you, Dolores. And she told me that she eventually started to really believe that that was true. And she began to slowly let herself off the hook for what her son chose. She prayed to be free from the bondage of this loss and felt moved to start praying the Lord's Prayer every time she felt the loss. She didn't know how to pray to God, and she figured out she'd start with the Lord's Prayer. So each time that wave of pain came over her, she would stop and say the Lord's Prayer. And over the years, she found herself feeling joy again. As I mentioned, her son was a musician. Actually, he was an incredible drummer. And she began giving a tenth of her income to a local music program that helped needy children and adults get musical instruments and have music lessons. Dolores will always miss her son. She will always grieve her son. But she has always been a also been able to receive a new life, honor his legacy, and do her part in creating a community of jubilee. And the priority of Jesus' ministry is to free all of us captives. We can hardly be human without being captive to something. And Jesus wants to set us free to know that we too are deeply loved. Not because we do it right all the time or make the right choices, but because it's Jesus' mission statement to love us and set us free so we can be loved, share love, and live love. Oh, for the grace for all of us to receive this love anew today and to be set free. Where do you long for freedom, my friends? Jesus longs to free us all to really live. And I'd also like to invite us to think about what this might mean for us as a congregation. A couple of the women in our Dwelling in the Word group this week indicated that they wonder if this invitation of Jesus, this release to the captive, means that all of us have the chance for a new beginning. One woman wrote to me, it releases us to be something else. I wonder if this message frees us to receive something new as a congregation. I'm going to speak frankly to you now because I really like you. I've been discouraged by how many times I hear these words, something like, we're just a bunch of older people. I want to say this to you. When we say that about ourselves, we're letting the youth culture define us. Yes, we are predominantly an older congregation, but there are also a number of middle-aged and younger people here with many gifts, but the majority of us are older. But we are full of gifts and talents and time and wisdom born from experience in life and what life has taught us and passion. We may be older, but I believe Jesus is using us and will continue to use us. And let's remember that sometimes Jesus uses people the world least expects, like uneducated, stinky old fishermen, for example, to bring the gospel to the world. I would invite us to stop saying that we are older and stop dreaming about how our age may be a strength and that we may be being released to living into the rich legacy of this Christ-centered and mission-driven congregation in new ways. Now, the challenge, of course, for being a group of older people is that we can sometimes get stuck in our ways and have a harder time being open to the new ways of being church together and in the world. We can tend to live in the glory days or the old days and try to recreate them rather than imagining how Jesus may be freeing us to something else. But Jesus is freeing us to be who we are and more. I wonder what that something else might be. There's a group that's been appointed by the session to eventually be elected as our pastoral nominating committee that first needs to help create a mission study. And this group and the session are looking at our mission statement, looking at some of the incredible visioning work that was done here a few years ago, and discern how God is calling us at this time. 
I pray that you will hold them in your prayers. And you will have an opportunity for some input into this process. And as we pray about this and listen for the Spirit's leading, let's keep in mind Jesus' mission statement. Because our primary call as disciples of Jesus is to follow him. Actually, I want to read to you, I think, our vision statement that was adopted by the session in 2015 really speaks to some of this. Let me read this to you. I don't know if you've seen it. You're going to be seeing it more in the future. But this is what some of you wrote. FPC Muskegon's vision is to nourish minds, bodies, and spirits, crossing boundaries, and devoting ourselves to serve in the name and spirit of Jesus Christ. Rooted deeply enough to risk being reshaped. I'm going to read that again. That's a powerful line. Rooted deeply enough to risk being reshaped, we will have the courage to continually explore new ways to move in the direction in which the church may be called by God. Friends, that's freedom right there. Also, I just want to read what our book of order says. The church is to be a community of faith entrusting itself to God alone, even at the risk of losing its life. Jesus' mission is to invite all of us and all humankind to a journey of freedom. And let's remember that this is also a journey of grace. We're hardworking people and we don't need to say, Egad, now i got to work at being free too. No, that's not the message here. We are loved by God more deeply than we know And Jesus will show us the way to be free. Our part is to listen and follow and know that sometimes the journey of freedom is one step forward, two steps back, two steps forward, one step back, right? But a day-by-day listening, following, learning to embrace each other and the common good. I'd like to close this sermon by inviting us to pray together. And this is a prayer practice you may want to try at home as well. Um, But this is a practice where we will um, seek to receive the gift of freedom that Jesus gives us. So I invite you to put your hands out like this and close your eyes. And let's ask God to show us places or things in our lives where we would like to be free. Don't force any thoughts into your head. Just see what rises. If nothing comes, don't worry. But just be still for a minute or two. It may be that grudge. It may be that worry. Where would you like to be free? Now imagine that thing or place in your hands. Imagine yourself in your hands. And imagine our church in your hands. And now pray with me. God, send us your spirit. We offer to you all these things that are in our hands. Help us hear you whispering, I love you in our ears. Set us free. Set us free, God, that we can be all who you have made us to be. And help us to follow you as you live out the mission statement. May we be people who proclaim good news to the poor, release to captives, even us, and work toward a world where the oppressed and their oppressors become free. Give us joy in this journey, we pray. Amen.